Okay, so in the last session, we talked a lot about budget lines and indifference curves. And in your problem set, you got practice um, figuring out where where budget lines and indifference curves are tangent to each other and where the optimal location for consumption is. And it was super mathy. Um, we talked about derivatives and calculus, and it may have been terrifying for some of you, and that's okay. Um, again, like that's kind of the mathy part of this class. Um, the stuff we're going to talk about now, you can theoretically do math for it and you can figure out the exact income and substitution effects. And in other classes, if you take like an actual economics class, um, you have to actually calculate this stuff. I don't care about the exact effects um, in your problem set. It'll ask you about income and substitution effects. Um, but I also say just make up numbers and like it's mostly going to be graphical and you drawing lines and points. And so don't worry so much about the math here. Um, and the reason why is because the concept behind income and substitution effects is actually super important for policy purposes. Um, and so that, that's what we're going to focus more on is kind of the, the practical application of this idea of indifference curves and budget lines. So <clears throat> if indifference curves are infinite and fake, because um, really, if you remember what an indifference curves, curve really is, it's the level of utility you get from the combination of two things. So if you want to get 15 utils out of eating calzones and waffles, there's some combination of calzones and waffles that you can eat. You could have one calzone and 10 waffles, or maybe 10 calzones and three waffles, and that would create the same amount of utility for you. Um, utility being like happiness points. Um, but that's really, really hard to measure because one, utility is a made up thing. Um, you can't really ask somebody how many happiness points the combination of two things gives um, because what do happiness points even mean, first of all? Um, and it's also weird because like, how do you know if I eat five of these and two of these, that gives me some number of happiness points. And then if I eat six of these and three of these, how many happiness points does that give me more? And Nobody knows. These are all, again, fake numbers. And so why do we even care about this? Um, and the reason we care is even though these are fake numbers um, and, in, and made up numbers and there's infinite numbers of, of indifference curves, um, it really does represent um, human behavior. Um, because this idea of having the indifference curve meeting the budget line and figuring out where they're tangent, um, that's, the, that's the principle of making it so happiness meets reality or the ideal meets reality. You would love to eat a billion calzones and a billion waffles, but you don't have the money for it. And so you're going to maximize your utility or maximize your happiness and get the right combination of that. Um, even though we can't actually measure that and we can't figure out the exact utility numbers people get, what economists do is they assume that people are going to consume what makes them happy. And so if you look out the window and you see people are buying stuff, economists just assume that they are revealing their preferences for those things and that is them maximizing their happiness. Um, there are all sorts of problems with that. That assumes that like people are spending money because they want to. Um, people are buying things because they want to, not because they're required to or because um, society dictates that certain things have to be bought or, or whatever. Um, so assuming that everybody's just making whatever choices they want, um, we can assume that if we look out the window and see people buying stuff, that is maximizing their happiness. And so um, we can read their minds and say that their budget line and their difference curves are meeting and that's where they're the happiest. Um, but again, that's probably actually not the case, but we can pretend because this is economics and we deal with lots of fake numbers. Um, the other reason why we care about this beyond the fact that it does kind of reflect what happens in reality is um, when you deal with policies, if you implement some new policy like a subsidy to encourage people to buy something or you implement a tax and make something more expensive to get, um, that changes the budget lines that people work with and changes what they consume. And so if somebody's consuming some amount of waffles um, and then we put a waffle tax on them, um, what's going to end up happening is they're going to consume fewer waffles um, and possibly fewer calzones. They're not going to necessarily change all of their consumption away from waffles. They'll substitute some of their calzones for some waffles because they're not going to want to give up all of their waffles completely. Um, and so that actually changes consumer behavior. If you tax one thing, it could be that the consumption of another thing, a complementary good, also changes or a related good changes. And so you don't want to have 
unintended consequences. Um, for like a classical example of this is if you like tax salt, then the, the demand for pepper is also going to change because salt and pepper go together. Um, that kind of idea. Like if you mess with one thing, it's going to have consequences later on. Um, and so what we want to do is be able to figure out systematically how we can measure those changes or measure how people respond to changes in prices. And this idea of indifference curves and budget lines lets us do that um, in kind of a systematic way using models and we can communicate this more clearly and universally to people instead of just saying prices change and people change. Um, we have directions and, and some math behind that. So that's, that's why we care about this for policy. Um, before we show the example of this, we have to talk about two specific types of goods. So a good is just something that you consume. Um, anything is a good. It doesn't have to be a physical thing, like a waffle is a good, but also services that you buy are goods. Um, just anything that you spend money on, basically, is a good. A normal good is something that if you get more money, then you spend more on that thing. Um, so food, for instance, if you earn more money, you're going to spend more on food. Um, you might buy more expensive food, you might go to restaurants more, um, but you're going to increase your consumption of food to a point. Um, it's not like Bill Gates is spending the same proportion of money on, on food now that he was back when he earned normal amounts of money. Um, there are kind of limits to, to those changes. Um, but in general, a normal good means if it becomes more expensive, you buy more, if it, or you buy less. If it becomes cheaper, um, you buy more. Um, as your income increases, you buy more. If your income goes down, you buy less. So this is kind of a normal, the normal idea of like, if something's more expensive, you're not gonna buy so much of it. There are also I, these things called inferior goods which are the opposite. And there aren't a ton of these out in the world, but they do exist. Um, this is the idea that as you get richer, you buy less of the thing. Um, the canonical example that is in all economics textbooks because they're written for undergraduates um, generally is that a classic inferior good is like ramen noodles. If you're a poor undergrad in a dorm room and um, if you like you, you rely on ramen noodles and boxed macaroni and cheese and kind of those kind of staples that are the classical starving college student uh, food. Um, as you get more money, um, you're going to buy less and less of that stuff and you're going to move on to other things. Um, you're going to substitute away the boxed macaroni and cheese for like homemade macaroni and cheese or um, the super cheap packaged ramen noodles for a fancy ramen at a, at a food truck or something. Um, and so that, that's this idea of inferior goods. We don't care so much about that for this class. Um, when we're talking about income effects and substitution effects and policy changes and stuff, um, we can generally assume that we're talking about normal goods where people will buy more of something if you change, the, if you lower the price of it, and they'll buy less of something if you raise the price of it. That's mostly what we care about. Okay, so the reason we care about this is because when you change the price of something, like a normal good, if we raise the price, for instance, people will buy less of it. Or if we lower the price, people will buy more of it. But when they're buying more of it, there's actually two parts, there's two reasons for them buying more of it. So let's say um, we want people to buy more waffles in our city. And so we have the price. Um, if waffles are a dollar each, we make it 50 cents each because we want to encourage waffle consumption. Um, and so maybe through tax subsidies or something, we, we implement some sort of policy that makes it so waffles are cheaper. So our assumption is that people will eat more waffles because the price goes down. Um, but they're going to eat more waffles for two reasons. One is because they're going to switch some of their calzones or their other food options to waffles. Um, so what that, and then some of it, so they'll switch some of their consumption from other food to waffles. And then some of that extra consumption will happen just because they're richer and they can afford to buy more. And so what we, that, that distinction there, switching away from other goods or just buying more because you're richer, that, those have two specific definitions in economics. The second was the income effect, where you buy more of something or less of something because you are richer or you're poorer. Um, so if you have a positive income effect, you're going to buy more waffles because you can afford to. Um, the fact that the waffles were halved in price means that you're essentially richer. 
Um, you have more money to spend on other things. And so you're going to buy some extra waffles because you have more money in your pocket um, because the waffles are cheaper. So that right there is the income effect. In the world of budget lines and indifference curves, and we'll show some examples of this, um, what that represents is you're moving to a new indifference curves or new indifference curve. So you're at some level of utility, you're happy. And then because the budget changes and it's cheaper to get waffles, you end up at a higher indifference curve. And so you're even happier. And so the movement from the original indifference curve to the new one, that is the income effect. It's what you're buying because you are richer. And that's, that's all. You're not switching any of that um, waffles or any calzones for waffles. You're not switching anything. You're just buying more stuff because you have more money. The other part of this is what is called the substitution effect. And this is, idea, this is the idea that you're trading off um, some of your consumption. And so you consume more waffles um, and you're giving up some extra calzones to do so. Um, and so this is mostly just a trade off at the original level of happiness, um, which we'll see graphically in a minute. And on the resources page for um, income and substitution effects, there's a video there where I walk through kind of a more detailed example of how all of this works. But really, at its core, the only two things you need to remember are kind of the conceptual differences between these two. If the price changes for waffles and people start consuming more waffles, part of that consumption is because they're just richer, so they're going to spend more money on waffles just because. And then part of that is the substitution effect. They're going to switch some of their consumption away from calzones and consume more waffles instead. And so that's the substitution effect. They're not buying more waffles just because it's cheaper, um, but they're doing it because they can trade, they have this, this decision to trade off. And so that's this difference between income and substitution effect. What this looks like graphically is this. And there's a, there's a more involved video on the resources page for today where I walk through exactly how all of this works. Um, and so I would recommend pausing this and going to the resources page and watching that video. I also link to a whole bunch of others um, that other people have put up on YouTube about how this all works. Um, the nice thing about this principle of income and substitution effects is that it's like really hard to wrap your head around. And so a ton of people have videos about how to do this because it is kind of weird and counterintuitive and tricky. Um, and so there's lots of resources out there for kind of walking through all of, all of the steps of how to do this. So this is kind of a, a briefer overview of, of how the mechanics of this, this changing in price works. Um, but you'll get more practice in your problem set. And there's a whole bunch of other resources on the resources page for today for the guide for income and substitution effects. So check that out and then come back here and we'll talk more about um, how this works kind of in a more summarized way. And if you went and did that, cool. If not, then stay along for the ride. Here we go. So in this graph here, you can see that, ignore the, the orange line, just look at the green line here. This is a normal budget line with an indifference curve tangent to it. This is what we've been doing in the past problem set and during the last session here, where what we assume is you have some budget who knows what that budget is. This is kind of just made up numbers and lines here. But given your budget, you could spend all of your money on 100 books, or you could spend all of your money on 1,000 of other stuff. What generally happens in, in these economic problems here is instead of just saying waffles and calzones and comparing two different goods, that's kind of unreasonable because you're not, again, going to buy just two different things your whole life. You're buying a billion different things. And so what ends up happening is instead of saying good one and good two, you say good one and everything else. So the decision here is you could spend all of your money on books or you could spend no money on, no money on books and spend all your money on all other goods or this AOG. So anything else. So it, it's kind of a a shortcut -y way of thinking about this instead of, again, comparing two different goods. It's just one good and anything else. Um, so this is our original budget line here where you could spend all your money and buy 100 books or spend all your money on other things and get no books and get a 1,000 other things or just some amount of other things. The actual numbers here don't matter. Um, and so what we can do is we can assume that this indifference curve here is meeting the budget line where it's supposed to, and that is the, that is the place where it makes this person the happiest. Notice how there's no math. 
there's no square roots, there's no first derivatives here. This is just like I drew a line and an indifference curve. That is a totally normal thing that people do. Um, there are mathy ways of doing this. If I gave you a utility function, then you could figure out exactly where it crosses, and then you can figure out the exact income and substitution effects. We don't care about that for this class, so don't worry. Um, so right now, this person is consuming 50 books and 500 other things. Um, but let's say books suddenly um, became half off. The bookstore in the city decided to sell all of their books at 50% um, off. And so now the person, instead of spending all of their money on 200 books, they could spend all their money, or on 100 books, they could spend all their money on 200 books. So because the books are suddenly cheaper, what that does is it makes this budget line swing outward. Um, and so now the, the possible combination of goods is a lot bigger. They could pretend, this person could potentially buy 150 books now, um, or even 200 books. They could, their, their purchasing production or purchasing possibility frontier here is a lot wider. And so that swings outward. If the price of something becomes more expensive, if the price of books doubles, what happens is this green line will actually swing inward. Um, because now instead of spending all your money on 100 books, you could spend all of your money on 50 books because they're twice as expensive. And so now that line is going to be a lot steeper. And so that's going to be the more constrained budget because of the change in price. So changing the price of books here makes this budget line swing inward and outward here. So as it goes out, that means um, things are cheaper. As it comes in, it means things are more expensive. Okay, so they have a new budget line here. Um, where it goes out to 200. And if we draw this indifference curve and kind of make it parallel, like draw a whole bunch of new indifference curves until we come out to where it crosses or is tangent to this new budget line, um, in theory, these should be exactly parallel. They kind of aren't quite because of drawing. Um, so just pretend that those are parallel indifference curves and it's just moving outward here. Um, what this shows is they're going to start consuming more books. This is at 90. So they went from 50 books to 90 books. And they also went from 500, book, 500 other things to like 600 other things or some other amount of other things. So they've, they've spent, they're spending more money now, both on books and on other things. Um, and so that, it, what, that is what we call the total effect, moving from A to B. So they were originally spending $50, and now they're spending, or they were originally buying 50 books, and now they're buying 90 books. So the total effect is 40 books. So this, the fact that we halved the price of books makes it so they are buying 40 more books, um, which is neat, cool. Um, but that total effect, we can actually, um, we can decompose it, is what it's called, into the income effect and the substitution effect. So the income effect, if you remember from a couple slides ago, means this person is buying more books simply because they have more money. And so they are um, increasing their consumption of books because they feel richer, and that makes them happier, and that moves them to this higher indifference curve. They're also buying more books because they're making some sort of trade-off with other goods. Um, they might be um, spending a little bit less money on other goods and a little bit more money on books. They're making some sort of internal trade-off, not considering having extra money. And that is the substitution effect. So we can actually draw this graphically and show both parts of these effects here. And the way this works, and again, this is the weirdest part of this whole thing, and that's why there's a billion YouTube videos about this, is we want to figure out both the income effect and the substitution effect. The total effect, we can see here on this graph here, um, shows that we went from, let's erase that, um, we went from this point A to point B, so that means we have a total effect of 40. But some of that is because of the, of the substitution effect, and some of that is because of the income effect. And if you notice in this graph, there's this weird point C that's right in between here. And so the math behind this is that the substitution effect is um, the distance between the original point and this imaginary middle point. And the income effect is the distance from this imaginary middle point to the new level of consumption. Finding this imaginary middle point, though, is the weird part. Um, and the way you do that, and 
I'll go through more of kind of the actual reasoning behind this in the resources page, um, in the video there, and in lots of the other YouTube videos that are linked there. Um, but what we do to find this middle point is we go to the new budget line here, which is, oh, okay, so we go to the new budget line, um, which is this orange line here. And if we move it back to where it would hypothetically touch the original indifference curve, this one right here. So we're just going to slide this whole new, the new budget line back. Um, and it shows up here in this graph as this dotted line here. So it is exactly tangent to the original indifference curve here at C. That is where the, the new, uh, that intermediate point is. So you basically draw the first budget line, figure out where the consumption is, swing the budget line out or in, depending on if the price changes. And then if you want to find the intermediate point, you basically take that new budget line, bring it back, so it touches the first indifference curve, and wherever it touches is the intermediate point, and then you can figure out the substitution effect and the income effect. And you'll get practice with this in your problem sets. I won't require actual numbers. Um, you would have to, you could do math and figure out um, the formula for these different lines and where they cross and what happens as you change them. We don't care about that, so don't worry about it. But as you can see here, there we do have two separate effects. We have a substitution effect and an income effect. So the substitution effect here means that we are buying 20 more books. So this distance from A to C. So we're buying 20 more books because we're trading off some of our other goods for extra books. Um, so we're, we're trying to get to a higher level of happiness um, we're, we're maintaining the same level of happiness here, this indifference curve here. So we're giving up, we're substituting some of the other things, uh, some of the all other goods, for additional books. Then we're buying extra books, 20 extra books, because that's our income effect here, because we're richer. And that actually brings us to this higher indifference curve. There's greater happiness at this level than there is back at this level here. So that is what's happening. The substitution effect, again, we're switching some of the all other goods for books, but then we are buying extra books because we're richer, and that is what boosts our happiness. So we have the substitution effect and the income effect working together to create this total effect of 40. And that's, what, um, that's what's happening in this, in this example. And again, the resources page for today has a whole bunch of other examples of this. Um, and so you'll get lots of practice with this. And let's turn that off. All right. Um, but this is, again, weird. And why do we care about this? Um, like, you can't measure this intermediate point C in any given person because, like, again, you can't, you can't measure people's preferences and translate them into formulas. And so there's no way to actually find a real life point C. Um, but when this gets applied to actual policies, we can use these indifference curves and budget lines to explain how people are going to respond to changes in policy. For instance, um, back in the early days of the Trump administration, one of the proposals um, to cut government funding and change um, how um, food stamps and SNAP is administered was um, there was a proposal to remove food stamps and make it so that um, people who qualify for, for food stamps no longer got a debit card where they could go to a grocery store and buy food with it. Um, instead, the proposal was to essentially replace it with a blue apron system where um, they would send you a box of food every week and you could eat whatever was in the box of food. And that way the government is, is just um, distributing food for you and you no longer go to the grocery store for that. Um, but one of the issues with this is that it removes a ton of the flexibility that you get if you have food stamps. Um, and so in the debates over this, what ended up happening was the uh, Department of Agriculture who cared about this um, uh, who, who was running this program, they argued that it maintained the same level of food value um, and maintain the, it allowed governments to, to have more flexibility in how they administered this program. They could choose whatever kinds of beans they wanted to send out. They could choose whatever kinds of flour the state wanted to send out. Um, but that removes a lot of the flexibility in how um, people can use the program. 
um, which isn't great. Um, we like people having more choices in, in how they consume food. And so um, here, this Kathy Fisher, um, the policy director at this, uh, this nonprofit that works in Philadelphia, said that right now, when people have access to SNAP benefits and um, they can use their EBT card, um, they can choose what they need. And so if somebody has a specialized diet, if somebody needs to eat gluten-free food, having this, this magical box, um, they called it the Harvest Box program, this, this fake blue apron thing, um, that was more universal. And so if you have special needs, you're going to get regular flour. If, you can't, if you're allergic to that, oh well. If you're allergic to peanut butter, they're going to send you a thing of peanut butter and oh well, um, you're stuck with that. And so that's not a great way of administering this, um, which is why there was so much pushback on this. Um, but rather than just say, talk about flexibility in kind of these um, more abstract terms, we can actually use indifference curves and budget lines to explain why there's less flexibility and why people are actually less happy and worse off um, than they could be if the government just gave them money um, instead of just giving them a box of food. Um, you can actually have more happiness and greater utility if the government just gives you money rather than a predetermined amount of food. So one way we can more formally explain um, why people respond the way they do and why there's less flexibility and less utility in this harvest box idea um, is we can use budget lines and indifference curves. And so here we have two different budget lines um, and two different indifference curves. And so if we look at this, um, we have if ignore this red line here. This is the original budget line. Notice how there's no numbers. This is great if you don't like math. Um, we've just kind of arbitrarily put stuff here. Um, what this is showing is that um, people could consume if they spent all of their money on whatever's in the harvest box, let's assume it has like dried beans and some cheese and some milk and flour and eggs and just kind of standard staples, what you might get um, using the Women, Infants and Children program or WIC. Um, this is actually a very similar example to how WIC works. Um, when you go to a grocery store using WIC money, you have to buy a predetermined amount of food and only certain types of food. Um, and so you're very limited in, in, in flexibility there. Um, whereas if you use an EBT card using SNAP benefits, you can buy anything that is food. Um, you can't buy like paper towels and paper plates and stuff, but you can buy anything that is, is edible basically um, with some limitations. So what we see here is there's some amount of stuff in the harvest box, flour, eggs, milk, butter, whatever. Um, a family could spend all of their money on stuff that's in the harvest box, or they could spend all their money on other food. So on this axis here, we have all other food, kind of like the all other goods example, but now just food. Okay, and because these are kind of standard boring food items like milk and peanut butter and eggs, they're not going to spend all of their money down here. They're not going to consume here because they don't really need that much stuff. So we're going to say that they're going to consume here at point A, where they're going to buy kind of their basic amount here, um, but they're going to spend lots of their money on other food um, that doesn't appear in this harvest box. They're not going to spend all of their money on dried pinto beans and black beans because you don't need to. You're going to spend your money on other stuff that's not in that box. Okay. So they have this indifference curve. This is where they're consuming. Notice how it's kind of flat out here. It's because they don't gain a ton of utility by buying more and more stuff that is in that harvest box, those staple items. Um, they get more utility from buying other food here. And so this is what they're consuming here. Um, and we assume that that's kind of the revealed preferences and that's, that's what they're buying. Um, what happens next is the harvest box program comes along and let's erase everything. It changes the budget line here. But notice something odd about this budget line. Um, instead of swinging it out and make, because what, that's what happened with the books, is they had some amount, um, and because the books were half off, there was a line that kind of swung out to this point. That's no longer happening here. Instead, there's this kink in the line, and it's flat, and then it starts going down. And the reason that kink is there is because the harvest box comes with some amount of those staples and they don't have to spend any money for that. They don't have to start spending money on other food up until this point. So they might not need 
like let's say the harvest box comes with like four gallons of milk and two pounds of butter and 50 pounds of flour and all of this stuff that are staples, boring staples that they're going to spend all their money on. Um, but too much of the staples, they don't need that much stuff. Um, but the harvest box gives it to them. And so they could consume back down at this level, but they don't need to because there's actually no difference between this level and this level. Like they don't have to spend any money to go from just a pound of butter to two pounds of butter to three pounds of butter. They're just going to get whatever's in that box. And so at this point, everything is flat. They can't use this money to buy extra food. Um, this is just what they get. And so they're going to consume over here um, because their preferences say they don't need those that many staples. They don't need that much food um, from that harvest box. If their indifference curve said that they loved the stuff from the harvest box, then they might be down at this point right here, and then they might move to this point with the new budget line. Cool. But if they don't actually need that much stuff, they're going to move from this point, and now they're buying way more stuff than they need, or they're getting way more stuff than they need. They're still getting more food. They have more money to spend on other food because they don't need to buy all of the milk and eggs and flour and butter and stuff. Um, and so that, that does make them better off. If you look at the original indifference curve and the, the harvest box indifference curve, they are happier. They are better off. Um, that's a higher level of utility there. So that's good. We want people to um, be able to consume more food and find more utility and more happiness. That's the whole point of the policy. But one problem with this is what would happen if instead of giving them the harvest box that had all of this prepackaged food that they have to basically deal with, um, what if instead of doing that, we just gave them money, um, like through um, food stamps or through an EBT card? If that was the case, what would end up happening is the whole budget line would change, down. it would shift outward, but instead of being flat right here, because they can't spend this money here that they're the extra food they're getting, they can't spend that money on other stuff, so they're limited by that. What would happen is you would get a budget line that looks like this, this dotted line here. So if the government gave you a hundred extra dollars for food, um, you could spend it all on this harvest box stuff, or you could spend a little bit of it on harvest box stuff and a lot more of it on other food. So you might buy a little bit more milk or a little bit more cheese, um, but you're also going to just spend money on other stuff. And so this is what would happen. Um, they're going to kind of maintain the same level that they were back with their original budget. They're going to get the same amount of milk and eggs and cheese and standard stuff. But now they can spend more money on other things, the things that they prefer and the things that they want, the things that bring them the most happiness or the most utility. And if you look at this indifference curve here, this is what they're getting with the harvest box, kind of that prepackaged food, what they have to deal with. And this is their indifference curve if they are using SNAP benefits or food stamps. It's actually higher. They are happier because they have more flexibility in how they spend their money. Um, and they don't have all of this extra wasted food. Um, this is actually, like, you can feel this in real life. Um, if you have been on food stamps or on WIC or both, um, you've experienced this. Um, when I was in graduate school, um, my wife and I were on WIC um, and on food stamps because um, PhD stipends are very, very low. And we had um, three and four and then five kids throughout graduate school. Um, so we qualified. And we ended up hating using WIC because we had to end up buying like three or four or five gallons of milk a week. We had tons of cheese. Um, we had tons of beans and juice, like none of our kids like juice, but we had to get the juice. And so we ended up with like a, a cabinet full of just juice um, that we ended up um, giving away. And we had to throw some of it away when we moved because there was no use for that juice. Um, and so because of this harvest, it's not the harvest box, but WIC does the same thing. Because WIC gives you this predetermined amount of food, we were consuming more or we were purchasing more milk and cheese and juice than we needed. Um, and so we were happier because we were getting more stuff, but we weren't as happy as we were had we just gotten money and we could, instead of spending all of that, that government money on, on juice, we could have spent it on other stuff. Um, and so there's a lot more flexibility with things like food stamps um, than there is with things like WIC. 
um, because again, you don't have the flexibility to make your own choices. Um, you see this in the nonprofit sector as well. There are lots of nonprofits that give out specific items um, like t-shirts or um, goats or cows. And that's great, but one issue with that is it forces people to consume that much of the stuff. So if you're a nonprofit that's distributing like 10 t-shirts per family or whatever, that family might not need 10 t-shirts um, and you're gonna give them that and they'll be happy, but that's too many t-shirts for them. They could be a lot happier and have a lot more flexibility in how they're actually spending um, any of that assistance if you gave them money or something that allows them to consume other food and make substitutions for things. Um, and so this is why this is important for policy is when you're doing some sort of subsidy that is not directly related to money, you naturally get this kind of kink in the budget line here where they're going to have to consume more stuff than they would actually want. Um, which does make them happier. Again, this indifference curve for the harvest box is higher than this original indifference curve, but they could be even happier and have more utility and get more benefit out of it if they had the same amount of, or spent this, if the government spent the same amount of money, but instead of giving them a ton of stuff that they don't need, give them the flexibility to still get those staples, but also spend things on other things and it'll make you better off in the end. And so again, like, this indifference curve stuff is weird. Um, these budget line things are weird, but it does translate into policy. And it does translate into uh, having important ramifications in the policy decisions that you make. Um, and so that's why we care about this stuff.